Welcome. Thank you all for joining us at today's program featuring Claudia Alvarez, presented as part of the Wignall Museum's Home Edition. Home Edition is a series of curated artist talks, workshops, and discussions featuring artists and cultural workers. My name is Rebecca Trawick. I'm the director and curator of the Wignall Museum. The Wignall Museum is a teaching museum and interdisciplinary art space that introduces Chafee College students, faculty, staff, and community members to innovative contemporary art objects and ideas. By fostering critical thinking, visual literacy, discourse, and empathy, the museum seeks to enhance the intellectual and cultural life of our community. We wanna take a moment to recognize that we are situated on the Ranch Cucamonga campus of Chafee College, which resides on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tongva people. We offer our recognition and respect to the elders, both past, present, and future. And hello, my name is Roman Stallenwerk. I'm assistant curator at the Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. Visit us at www.chafee.edu slash Wignall to access our full schedule of programs and available recordings. You can follow us on social media, including Facebook and Instagram at Wignall Museum. When possible, recordings are made available on our website. Announcements post to our email subscribers and social media when new videos are available. All recordings on our site include captions and audio descriptions as options. We ask that you complete a brief survey after the session at tinyurl.com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. Thank you. And hi everyone, my name is Andy Hadel. I'm the preparator at the museum. I'll be assisting Rebecca and Roman in with today's Zoom session. In a moment, Claudia Alvarez will present for about a half an hour or so with the remaining time being available for Q&A. Thanks, Roman and Andy. So today we're thrilled to introduce Claudia Alvarez. Claudia Alvarez is a Mexican-American artist living in New York City. She received her BA from the University of California, Davis in 1999, and her MFA from California College of Arts, San Francisco in 2003. Alvarez is currently a visiting artist, assistant professor at Pratt Institute and lecturer at New York University. Alvarez explores notions of memory, immigration, and identity in her work. Through drawing, painting, sculpture, and site responsive installation, she investigates fundamental questions about human behavior, ethics, and power struggles. Her work addresses the way social, political, and psychological structures impact our behavior and personal interactions. By imbuing sculptures of children with adult characteristics and mannerisms, Alvarez tackles issues relating to violence, empowerment, endurance, and what they reveal about human nature. Alvarez's work has been exhibited in the United States, Europe, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. Alvarez has received multiple grants and has participated in residencies across the US, Mexico, Japan, and Switzerland. And her work has been included in a number of collections at major institutions across the US and Mexico. Please visit our website for more information about Alvarez or visit her site directly. We'll put that link in the chat in a moment. And we're so happy to see Claudia again um, we, I think it was in 2010, she participated in a large group exhibition titled Separation Anxiety at the Wigdall Museum, so we're thrilled to have her back. So please join me in giving Claudia Alvarez a warm virtual welcome. Hi, Claudia. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for inviting me and everyone at the Wigdall Museum who is involved in the Home Edition series. Thank you, Roman and Andy for being here and participating in, uh, in, this, in what uh, we're gonna be showing today. Um, I would like to share uh, my slideshow of images. It's, uh, it goes on a loop and there are uh, images that are mixed in uh, my painting and sculpture and also my community projects, residencies and teaching. They're all kind of intertwined together. And I wanted to show you just how everything's interconnected in my life and, and what I've been doing. So um, over the past 20 years, um, they have influenced each other and the trajectory of my development. Uh, during the pandemic, I spent long periods of time absent from my ceramic studio in Brooklyn uh, when the lockdown first happened. I avoided the subway and most of the work that I was doing was from home, in my home studio here in Manhattan. I was mainly working with large watercolors and uh, drawings. 
So for the past few years, I've been exploring, exploring botanicals native to Latin America, specifically from Mexico and from the Central Valley of California where my family settled in the early 1970s. I grew up around my family's garden consisting of plants and trees. My mother is in her late 80s and she still sells plants, uh, fruit trees, every kind of plant, and she still lives in California. Her house has always been busting with flowers and many kinds of plants. In the backyard, I played with the mud. I uh, worked in her garden and I even boxed, uh, had mar boxing matches as a kid around uh, the uh, filled with flowers. So here I am boxing and uh, kind of beating up the local kids <laughs> and um, all around flowers. So uh, the past few years I have been making sculptures re referencing botanical plants, uh, mainly using porcelain, paper clay and stoneware clay. It has allowed me to explore a range of new images and sculptural forms. I don't have any images of that. Um, I'm still developing it, uh, but I hopefully will eventually uh, finish that work in a few years, hopefully, we'll see. Um, so during the Black Lives Matter March, they were happening right outside my window. I live in Manhattan and in Soho, and I'm one block away from where the uh, marches were happen happening daily. So with the stay at home restrictions this past summer, I began thinking about the unicorn in captivity the tapestry at the Met Cloisters in New York. I, uh, I wanted to make them and recreate them. And so instead of making a white unicorn, I made the unicorn from a black brown perspective and what that means today. As an immigrant, I'm interested in how identity works and how we are seen. In the work, I specifically depicted botanicals native to African countries. Exploring botanicals through the black brown unicorn allowed me to think about immigration and the connections of idea about identity, memory and portraiture. I think about our history and our ideas related to the conquest. The idea of taking resources from a country and the use of labor or of people as property and ownership of land. While looking at plants, I was interested in England's, England's documentation from the explorers from the 1970s excuse me, in the 1700s, who discovered botanicals across America and renamed them. Most of the wa watercolors you're looking at are taken from flowers and images from my mother's garden. So um, I'd like to begin with a brief, brief description of my art practice and how I arrived at making this kind of work. So my work, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, engages in subjects such as immigration, violence, isolation, youth, and aging. I am most interested in ethics and its function to critique. It allows me to ask different kinds of questions about people's ideas between right and wrong. It allows me to think about political structures, human behavior, human nature, rooted in deeper personal observations of race, culture, identity, economics, and language. I'm interested in the primal impulses and the immediacy of clay and also in drawing. They somehow lead me to these topics. In many of the installations, there are ceramic figures. Some are painted or glazed, others are just fired. At times, they are in groupings, uh, often to create a tableau. I think about the creative, creating an environment or an emotion, at times responding to the surrounding space. Nearly all of the figures have the physique of children, yet many display behavior of adults. I explore the same or similar kinds of imagery in painting and more recently in video. Most of my work is somehow connected to the people I know and people that I worked with in communities that I have engaged in. In their stories, I found connections to social issues ranging from immigration, racial intolerance, and concepts stemming from fear, hate, to violence. Many of my work is based on my own experiences and also of my family, and sometimes they're inter intertwined. The foundation of my work stems from memory how we remember our past, reflect upon it, and we contextualize it through the process of art is interesting. I also think about memory as a way to draw what I remembered of that object to be or the character of someone. When I work with clay, I don't work from a model or an image. I focus on the building process and how the sculpture emerges. I'm interested in notions about the body through imagination, experience, and reference to observation physically and psychologically. I was born in Mexico and legally immigrated to the United States in 1972 when I was three years old. We became American citizens in the 1980s. 
I became more aware of my identity, speaking Spanish at home and English at school around second grade when a few boys playing at the playground shot at me and my brother with a BB gun. As I ran, I was shot from behind. I'm interested in how we remember certain things and how it shapes our identity, reimagining what is experienced, what is observed, and how cultural practices evolve and change our perspective is curious in the development of how images appear. I remember how abstract it was to attend the Mexican rodeo as a child in California and experience the tra traditional charro costume dresses and the horses. My sister used to perform at the rodeo with her rope and my mother used to make costumes for her. Uh, to me, she was a Mexican cowgirl and I was really aware of the two cultures. This merge in this acculturation, balancing of both cultures and adapting to being American. An idea may stem from a personal thought or experience and is initially a drawing, a single drawing or a painting. It is a starting point to enter into a body of work to explore variations on that theme, allowing a body to transition into possibly making work that I did not plan on making. I work between materials at the same time on disparate ideas in search for transformational quality in the work taking the in intimate or personal to potentially find universal connections between merging the meaning, material, content, intention, and evolution. I am interested in the process of how ideas are recontextualized and at times have social or cultural implications in how we think about our collective experience. Over the years, I sometimes revisit a concept with a different iteration on a theme with titles such as the dirt cleaners that you see and the history of immigration to explore those ideas in new materials. In the studio, I ask how the construction of the self through a fragmented memory have the potential to evolve in the changing nature of the consciousness from youth to old aging, to youth to aging. I explore how they can coexist in the same space visually or emotionally. I often think about human nature and power structures. There are many kinds of power, political, economic, cultural, physical, and even power relating to health. Some of the child imagery comes from the 12 and a half years I worked at a hospital. From the age of 17, I was hired at the University of California Davis Medical Center, first as a patient escort, then as a med transit driver, driving terminally ill patients from their bed in the hospital to the treatment centers throughout the campus. We also serviced the Shriners Hospital next door. I worked there until I was accepted into graduate school uh, for fine art when I was 30 years old. During this time, I was an undergraduate at UC Davis. I was making ceramic water jugs and distorted hearts and lungs. I also made them with pastel drawings. My professor at the time was Annabeth Rosen and one of my painting professors is Wayne Thibault. My memories of working with children at the Shriners Hospital and working with the elderly and the critically ill at the medical center influenced the kind of work that I would eventually create. Combining child imagery with older characteristics allowed me to address both human vulnerability and strength simultaneously. The, ch the children I worked with appeared mature, experienced, wise. The old patients were like children they were filled with fear and looked very vulnerable. The children were brave, strong, and somehow overcame illnesses. The adults were afraid, bitter, at times with themselves and with their children. I was also uh, careful when I carried my patients. I had a two-year-old little boy with a pale translucent skin with an enlarged belly on my gurney, working from memory and clay the small body appeared as a little vessel or water jug with age marks on the surface of the clay, reminiscent of an old soul, reminding me of my first clay vessels. Some appeared to look like human organs. I saw patients expressing great joy when their child laughed and experienced great sorrow when their child was in pain. The two extreme emotions are so complicated and layered. In my work, I focus on the subtlest gesture and the simplest gaze and how the two emotions can coexist in the, in the simplest way. For me, that time was really powerful because I was you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. 
and to see that and to be a part of that and to help families was really uh, incredible and had a big impact. I want to somehow simplify. I was not making work specific to a person or about death, rather a combination of the cultural between me, my identity, the work, and even history. It is the child spirit in the adult that I search for and vice versa. The child size sculpture parallel adult characteristics and mannerisms. I'm interested in how their intimate scale reflects and occupies our space. Their small body frame for me functioned in surrogates to embody psychological and sociological structures of human behavior. Within the frame of a small body appears a person at different stages of aging and development from innocence through puberty to adolescent behavior and through the process of aging, I try to grasp a deeper understanding of the human condition. I'm reminded of the Velasquez midget paintings depicting a small adult body in a modest size frame. Their faces are so human and so humble, yet the paintings feel and seem to embody grandness and intensity. I worked with patients of all ages and illnesses from renal dialysis patients, cancer, burn patients, and people with rare, rare cases. The elderly, the children were, and the most vulnerable, like the homeless and uh, people who didn't speak English affected me the most. Because the child-sized sculptures looked like children with aged faces, I began to look at child culture and the inquisitive child's mind as they ask unfiltered questions that parallel the ultimate nature of art, questioning notions of social structures. The work depicting violence came about when I was reflecting on the notions of childhood. It led me to investigate American cartoon uh, cultural culture and our exposure to violence. I went online and typed kids with guns. I was surprised to see images of kids in America at the shooting range. I had imagined I would see children soldiers from third world countries. This led to a range of questions and imagery over the years. And in that I searched for universal themes, attempting to attempt to connect similarities between different kinds of people, searching for ideas related to tolerance. I am curious about people, their compassion and how inclusion begins. The volunteer work I have done throughout the years initially was a came about because uh, someone needed a Spanish speaking person or a commercial driver. In the beginning, uh, teaching happened naturally. Instead of just driving or translating, I winded up also teaching art. At the same time, I had a commercial driver's license uh, to drive an ambulance and a Class C vehicle, uh, which is a commercial vehicle such as a large bus and a wheelchair vehicle. And I wind up riding, dr uh, driving big motor homes and big, big buses as well. I did a lot of moonlighting at the medical center too, driving really large buses, the 40 passenger. And I was about 19 or 20 and about hundred pounds. <laughs> so it was really funny to see this, per this small person with this huge steering wheel. Um, in the late 1990s, I drove a group of high school students who volunteered to work in the community around Mexicali. I went as a driver and a translator and soon realized there was a need to work with a specific group who had been overlooked. They were young girls ages 13 to 21 who were single mothers. I drove with a friend to the border for art supplies and the next day we taught a textile workshop. The focus of the project and discussion was around worth and value of women in their communities. I taught the girls how to create curved angles with cardboard and to make various containers and how to sew fabric around a container. In the late 1990s, around 97 or 99, while an undergraduate at UC Davis, uh, and at the same time taking ceramics classes, I was working with migrant children near Woodland, California, teaching California history and ceramics uh, through, an art, uh, through a program called Arts Bridge Program. I would revisit this area to do a ceramic installation in the orchards and fields, and I think uh, the images are, are there. I had made uh, work there uh, when I was a visiting artist and teaching ceramics at UC Davis for a semester. When I was 13 years old, I had worked in that area uh, with my girlfriends for the summer. Uh, it reminded me of my first summer also uh, working um, as a child picking cherries and also um, 
during that summer when I was 13, I, we picked in the fields, we picked plums and all kinds of things. I think about the fields, the grapevines, the cherry orchards, often the smell of the dirt in California is like no other. I have a deep connection with it. For many years, I did not have a ceramic studio and relied on residency programs to have access to ceramic facilities, at times spending two weeks to a few months making projects for that year. I applied to many programs with specific projects in mind. It allowed me to travel to a place and focus on a project. Some included the Northern Clay Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts in Nebraska, and the Vich Lachille in Nyack, New York, and others in France and China as well. And usually the first few weeks at the residency, I would work with clay, and after the sculptures would dry, I would focus on painting and drawing. My first residency was during my second year of grad school. I took a year leave of abs absence to participate in a six month stay in Switzerland called Futur in the village of Rappersville, south of Lake Zurich. My professor invited one MFA student a year to apply to the program. The residency offered a monthly stipend, a furnished apartment and a beautiful art studio built in the 1300s that were uh, the marble floors and glass elevator. It was really beautiful. And I worked with uh, paper and plaster and uh, any objects that I can find at the time. My second residency was in 2005 at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts in Omaha, Nebraska. When I was an undergraduate in 1997 at Davis, my ceramic professor had invited an artist by the name of June Kaneko for a glaze workshop. We made over a thousand pounds of clay and created large plates for him to glaze. During his lecture, he had spoke about his, he had spoke about his wife who, focused, who, uh, who founded the Bemis Center, uh, which is an internationally known residency, and it sounded amazing. As an undergraduate, I knew I would apply if I went to grad school, and right after grad school, I applied uh, to go there. In 2004, when I graduated from the California College of Arts in San Francisco with my MFA, I applied to the Bemis Center and was accepted. Uh, at the time I was teaching in Los Angeles at Biola University. And during this time, I was also volunteering across the border in Mexico uh, at this orphanage called Ensenada. I, took, uh, I taught kids art from third grade all the way up to young adults. Uh, the orphanage allowed kids to stay there until they were 21 if they needed to. I had planned to stay in Omaha for three months and it turned out I never moved back to California. Since 2005, I had been uh, working, living between Omaha, Nebraska and New York City, spending most of my time now in New York since around 2009 and mainly because of teaching and my studio. While in Omaha, I was able to participate in different communities, teaching art to various organizations, including in Lincoln, Nebraska. Through the Hayden Art Center, I worked with a program called uh, La, the Latino Center, helping Spanish-speaking women of domestic violence in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, this was really incredible. Uh, we, as you can see in the images, uh, we did all different types of uh, projects, painting on fabric. Uh, during that time, I also taught in after-school programs, painting murals and also teaching ceramics at El Museo Latino in Omaha. And I also worked at the Hope Center, which was an after-school program in North Omaha teaching ceramics to local African-American kids. And while in Omaha, I also worked uh, with uh, the local library and worked with the local high school kids. Uh, we Students made clay. I taught them how to make clay, how to make glazes, how to design a mural and create a budget. They did a presentation with the head librarian and uh, they discussed everything from the concept to installation and maintenance. And we created a permanent installation at the local library there. In 2012, I bought a count finally <laughs> and had my first studio in Brooklyn. With the strict fire safety codes in Manhattan, uh, it was difficult to find a space willing to allow me to install a kiln. And so this was the first place that allowed me to put an, an electric kiln and I've been there ever since. In my studio, I explore different kinds of materials. I am curious about the potential of clay because of its range and possibilities. From the firmness of touch to its sensual nature when modeling, its gestural subtleties from wetness to bone dry, and mostly I'm attracted to the malleable qualities. It allows me to work quickly. It has the ability to record the movements of the mark, the fingerprints, and the gestures in the building process. I am interested in all of it, 
from making clay and glazes to research and glaze chemistry and clay bodies. I'm interested in the engineering process. I love the idea of building hollow. I love centering, weight and balance, shifting of hollow forms and creating asymmetrical shapes with the hollow forms. And it really influences my drawing and painting as well. They go back and forth. I feel a connection to pre-Columbian ceramics. Its history feels so intimate and yet it is so mysterious. I think about the imagery of Mother Earth seen in Chicano art and in the Mexican murals. I am curious about the cultural merging of Western art history and native studies. The Virgin of Guadalupe in contrast with Sandro Botticelli's Birth of Venus and the mother goddess seen in the ceramic figurines of ancient Mexico. How are they all interconnected and how do I make sense in my work? Delving into the various aspects of my ceramic studio from recycling clay, breaking chunks of dried clay, vacuuming, mopping, glazing, and sometimes making clay with my feet, all contribute to the ideas in my process. Every aspect is important and meaningful to me. Putting my hand inside the slimy recycled clay reminds me of playing with mud as a child. And, the, and also the various tasks my mother did while gardening, digging a huge hole in the backyard in order to mix her magic recipe of dirt. I always thought of her combinations of dirt and fertilizer to have magical powers. Her herb plants could heal anything and anyone. Her fruits and flowers grew like Jack and the Beanstalk. Responding to the raw nature of clay and its processes, my approach is, is mostly intuitive. For me, clay is a way to draw with coils in three dimensions. I work back and forth. I sometimes approach things formally or aesthetically. At times I think about specific events and their social impact. What is happening in the world abstractly enters intuitively in my process. I try to, to use the idea of fragmented narratives to approach different kinds of stories as a way to understand relevant issues and how they con connect universally. For, from an intimate relationship between mother and child to global concerns related to power, territory, and the environment, to ethically, social, and humanitarian concerns and how they interface historically. And how can I have a voice as a brown person? The overarching themes in the world propel me to work out ideas in my studio and ask questions about my role. How will I contribute to and or be active in a community? It has led me to different kinds of community service from teaching workshops to creating public projects ranging from murals uh, and schools, working in schools after school programs to uh, having socially engaged discourse with students uh, and also uh, young kids as well. Since 2009, I have worked uh, in the surrounding boroughs of New York uh, with underrepresented youth in elementary schools and high schools, first with uh, Rush Philanthropic Arts Foundation and now with Art Yard Brooklyn. I combine art history and basic art techniques such as teaching grayscale painting combined with learning about civil rights movements as you see in some of the slides that I am showing uh, working with middle school kids. And in this particular project, we were working with a, a theme titled the Year of Freedom. And each year Rush and Art Yard has a theme and each year we make projects and at the end of every six months, we have exhibitions with the kids and they learn how to um, give talks, how to be docents. And so it's pretty exciting to, uh, to see them grow and develop. Teaching art at the Young Women's Leadership School, we used our bodies and the movement of our hands to draw. We did a meditation with our eyes closed. We drew with our, both of our hands while I guided the students on a journey visualizing fast and slow marks with charcoal, making long gesture glides or short aggressive marks. We hung the large drawings and projected the videos we made for our exhibition. You can see this during the exhibition uh, with the videos, you can see the sound of the charcoal and the movements of the charcoal. It was really exciting to see that. And at California State Summer School for the Arts, where I taught at CalArts campus, I was there from, I think, 2006 to 2011. Uh, we were only there for one month, and we had three weeks, and each student created three large sculpture. 
and to make a collaborative installation. Um, and I gave them readings. We would discuss articles and readings. And in this particular case, we made a chess set and we uh, responded to the readings and discussions of the art of war. And uh, each year we, uh, uh, when we made the chess, I did that about three years in a row. Um, each time we also would come up with a different theme. And so the imagery was completely different as well. In Miami, I worked with young men in detention centers. And the following year, I worked with several co-ed centers around Miami area. We created a project and displayed it at the lobby of the Perez Museum during the art fair in Miami. Each project starts with a lesson and a concept in mind, but the students bring the content and each one has a story. And working with the kids at the detention center, it was really amazing to see them kind of open up and, and uh, be willing to tell their story. Uh, this summer I taught a workshop on Zoom uh, with Art Yard with the theme on community. We looked at, at artists who were engaging in communities virtually because of the coronavirus pandemic. We created art with materials available to us, making work about the environment, social justice, and looking at creative ways to collaborate. And this led to a new body of work that uh, you can see in my, um, on Instagram, uh, or I can, I'll eventually show it at some point. Uh, in my studio, I work across materials and I teach, this, I teach in the same way as well, exploring materials that best ex can explore that idea. I have been drawing since I was a child and in seventh grade, I used to draw for, for my classmates. I was making ink drawings on white pillowcases. I had several stolen from my locker uh, in junior high. My first paintings were on fabric. I was uh, around 13 or 14 years old my mother used to sew baby blankets and gift them uh, when every time we had a new baby in the family. She also would sell them for baby shower and christenings. She would say, make an angel or make a teddy bear or make a unicorn and so on. And I would carefully, very fine with the fine brush would paint whatever she wanted on there. And I would try not to make a mistake. Uh, during that time, my mother was painting on aprons that she sewed. She sold them at the local cannery where she worked she painted directly from the tube, which is the opposite of what I was doing. <laughs> and she also used to write on them in Spanish. And her writings were usually very vulgar. They were, in, they were, she would say something, she would write something like pinche tu madre or cabrona or anything that would uh, make the ladies from her work laugh and they would, wear, they would wear them to work. And this really kind of allowed me to think about loosening up and being very gestural in my paintings. And not and just because she would also paint images just from right out of the tube. Uh, and so they were very abstract. And um, I just thought that was really uh, enlightening for me to, uh, to have the ability to, to loosen up. When she was diagnosed with breast cancer in her early 80s, I wanted to revisit that work with her. After her recovery, I asked if she wanted to collaborate. Our discussions led to what would, uh, what would an image look like and what would it look like now versus then? And also what would happen if we used bright colors in the fabric? I painted the blankets during a residency I did at El Museo del Barrio in New York and exhibited them at the end of the residency. In drawing, I think about line and gesture. I am drawn to the subtleties of drawing. There's an ink drawing by Isabel Bishop from 1935 of a mother and child on a couch. And uh, in that image, I think about it a lot. Um, in the image, you can see volume, you can see value, you can see line drawing, gesture drawing, large wash of shadow. And there's a little section that renders a fine detail in the face. Uh, the feet are drawn with contour. And you can see this with, with the simple abstraction of the outline of the foot. And I often think about that and how I may translate that into the surface of the clay. In other words, how would I create a composition around three-dimensional sculpture? to have ideas of making a line, embedding that into the clay, creating gesture with my hands or with my thumbs, reflecting the movement of, of uh, the building process. And how would I work detail? What areas would I pick a little detail? And what areas would I smooth out? And how would I show the fingerprints? And, uh, this, and also I think about it formally. How would I think about that in terms of painting the sculpture? And I, I do think about ideas of painting and the relationship to it. So in other words, the physical relationship of sculpture to painting. Uh, and so that's really allowed me to kind of um, just look at the sculpture as a canvas in a way. 
And I think for that reason, a lot of the times I don't uh, glaze them heavily or, or sometimes I don't uh, add any surface to them because I'm more in that particular sculpture, I may be more interested in the fingerprints and the marks of the, of the clay. I sometimes gesso my sculpture and oil paint them and I treat the oil paint kind of like a patina. I often underglaze them and mix uh, the underglazes in the same way that I would treat watercolor oil paint. So I take the powdered ceramic pigments and I mix slip with it. And sometimes I mix a uh, frit or some material, uh, ceramic material that will melt it a little bit. And I try to treat that as a painting as well. And sometimes I just simply add watercolor to the, to the ceramics directly. As you can see in some of the images there that some of them are, um, they're labeled so you can see which ones have watercolor and which have oil paint and, and so on. I also like to treat the surface of the ceramics with their other materials as well. I add plaster, gesso, gold pigment, all kinds of other things. Um, in the exhibition titled Acércate, which means to come close, I applied oil painting, watercolor, and some uh, gold pigment to the stoneware after the firing. In 2014, I received a research grant from Art Matters in New York and a residency at SOMA to work in Mexico City, where I had a solo exhibition at Centro Nacional de las Artes, which is the National Art Center. Uh, my first few days in Mexico, I made paper clay with my feet. My research involves studying ancient ceramics, mostly naturalistic figurines that were depicting everyday life. I mainly looked at work from the Stavenhagen collection, which are really sweet little miniature figurines. And I also spent a lot of time at the Anthropology Museum. The collection influenced the sculptures I made for the exhibition uh, there in Mexico. Um, I, uh, I think I was there for, I think it took me about a month or two to make the work and wind up being, I, I think it was like uh, 12 or so sculpture. Uh, during that time, uh, the uh, Sen Art are also arranged for me to speak with students at the art school there uh, called La Esmeralda. And I was also invited to give a lecture at the uh, National Autonomous University in Mexico, where I met with students in the ceramic department, Sp spending time in Mexico City uh, really kind of influenced me. And I have been back there several times and I feel like I have a lot more uh, research to do there and to learn. So I'm really excited about that. Um, a similar sequence of events unfolded during a residency in Japan in 2016, where I also worked with the local clay. The residency was timed to coincide with the Sasama International Festival in Shizuoka, which brought together artists and professionals from across the world and also an undergraduates from uh, Japan. Uh, it was uh, really amazing to be in uh, Japan uh, because the little village that I was in, uh, there was no children or no young people. The, I think the youngest person was uh, 50 years old. So it's 50 and older. And uh, the residency location was a, used to be the elementary school. And it also uh, convert, was converted into a residency and a spa and some other types. It was used for a multi-purpose event. And uh, the high school had been transformed into a museum, a ceramic museum. And the, uh, I, I had, was listening to the stories of the local people who were saying that it was really sad to see their last young person leave the town. So I think after their last seniors graduated from high school, they closed the high school and they converted into a museum. And so I wanted to make a sculpture that kind of references uh, the idea of memory. And so I made a mother and child with seven standing sculpture uh, around the, 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 big, the center of town. As soon as you enter the town, you can see the sculpture. And, uh, and, and again, you know, I was working with ideas of memory. And for me, the idea of memory, uh, I try to use that abstractly on the surface of the clay. The festival in Japan featured a series of lectures, demonstrations, and exhibitions I, part I participated in. They also had a small food fair and an art fair of local ceramic potters. And uh, the, the permanent installation uh, was uh, around the green tea factory in the village, uh, which was the main production um, of that town. So I was only there for three weeks. And so I think within the first week and a half, I made all that work. And uh, I basically, um, they basically built a kiln around my pieces when they were still wet. 
and we fired them still wet and the local people were cutting the wood and building the kiln. It was uh, really amazing that it happened so quickly and so fast. And, um, and so you, uh, it was really just incredible to kind of see that. So that's kind of um, what I've been doing these last 20 years, Rebecca. <laughs> I think it's been 10 years since I last saw you. But uh, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, I know that the images are scattered in and out. And I kind of did that on purpose because you can just see how I'm, I, uh, I talk about going through like a new iteration of an idea. I visit the same idea over and over again. Uh, and I think because I feel like it's, I go through my sketchbook and I think I have this great idea and then I go back to 2007 and that's, it's the same idea, <laughs> but it's a new iteration of that. And so um, I feel like there's uh, so much, you know, I think the first couple of statements that I made are, were kind of loaded and there's like so much um, things that I can do with that just one simple research, you know, with the surface and the texture and the face and the memory and all those kinds of things. Well, oh, thank you, Claudia. What a beautiful and generous presentation. Um, I know at the beginning, I, or maybe it was even before we let everyone in, you, 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 you made a comment about how your work and your life is so intertwined and, um, you know, interesting to see how your influences, your community service and teaching and the themes you investigate, your research, your travel, all of it, um, you know, keeps, keeps uh, informing everything that you're doing in the studio. That's really um, incredible. I don't know if I, if this is just personal knowledge from, you know, from my experience with your work in 2010, or if I read this somewhere, but um, I believe your, many of your children are almost lifelike, but not exactly lifelike. Um, can you talk about your choice of scale and, and equally if you're making those same choices in your 2D work as well? Yeah, I, um, in my sketchbook, I have really small little uh, smaller scale stuff, but uh, but in, in generally I do like to work almost life size, uh, kind of like a five five year old, and I think part of it was that I was uh, haunted by the children that I had worked with and uh, picking up of the of this these little these little bodies, and so I, I wanted to keep them to a scale that uh, kind of existed in the same space, uh, but but at the same time uh, were just slightly off to reality. Uh, and wanted to really think of them more as a magical space or a surreal kind of space. But they do feel that they are life size in a way. I think the biggest ones I have made are anywhere between 40 inches. I, I, if you see the mother and child, those are life size. But the, um, but the ones that I have done in the last 10 or 15 years are anywhere between 34 to 36 inches. So it's somewhere around a third, three, three year old or four year old. And um, I like that, um, that you can enter them and you have to kind of move your body down to them. Uh, and with the, um, the work titled uh, Falling, the uh, sculptures are looking up at you. And I, and I think that was a conscious thing to think about um, how can I change the physicality of us not, not going down? What would it look like if you were just looking down at them and they were looking up at you? And so I played around with that a little bit, like how can you physically, how can they have that space and have a grandness? You know, even if I just put one piece in a space, you know, um, I had someone here that came to cut, cut my hair and, and, um, and he said, uh, I can't stop thinking about that sculpture that's looking at me. <laughs> and I had it like way on the other side of the, of the studio facing the other way, but yet they can feel it in, in the same space. And I just thought that was so interesting. Like, how can I make it as subtle as possible even if the back is turned? So I, I do play with that idea as well as like when I put them in a space, sometimes I just show the back and it kind of brings, hopefully brings someone to come closer to them. So Gabriella has a question in the chat. Where do you see your garden installation taking you next? Um, that's, uh, that's really interesting. I'm not sure yet. I, um, I'm really thrilled. I've been doing it for a long time and I've been thinking about them for a long time. I just haven't glazed them or most of them I have not glazed. And, um, I, I'm not sure exactly what kind of environment I'm going to uh, create for them, but I, most likely they will have a, one figure or some figures interacting with, with them in some way. But I think the most exciting thing about working with, um, 
with the garden pieces is that I'm really dealing with gravity. I'm dealing with asymmetrical shapes. I'm dealing with negative space underneath them. I'm creating roots underneath them. And I'm, I'm also figuring out creative ways to fire them and creative ways to put them together. And I'm also uh, mixing various kinds of, of clay. So I, every three months I change the clay body. Uh, even though the flowers are still porcelain, I'm still working with various clay bodies to see um, that unpredictability. Uh, so, I, I'm, uh, so I'm kind of curious about that. But, uh, but I have been looking and researching botanicals and making drawings of them and kind of researching where they came from and what part of uh, California or what part of Mexico they're from and then how I can kind of mutate them into a sculptural shape, you know. So I'm curious. I, and I think one of the things that I might want to do uh, in the future is to do a residency so that I may make them larger as well. Because in my studio, I can only make them around uh, 37 inches without, uh, fra without fragmenting them. So I have been able to lay them in parts and then attach them to look like they're one piece. But I don't like to fragment them. I don't like to make them look like they're broken or separated. We have another comment and question in the chat uh, from Priscilla. Um, they say, amazing presentation, exclamation point. You have an amazing body of work. Where do you keep all of your pieces? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, they are all over the place. Um, I do, my husband and I have a storage in Nebraska. Um, he bought a dance building. Uh, so I didn't usually need to store them. Um, I had a gallery early on and was able to have find places for them. Um, but uh, but as the time goes by, I I they're they're hidden everywhere. I have them in corners and closets, and <laughs> they're all over the place. So um, so yeah, they're they're building up. So someday I'll have a big installation of them. So. I like that you have a lot of little children hiding. All over the place. I think that's <laughs> yeah. The studio has really high ceilings, as you can see, they're super high, and so um, the the closet areas are super high. And so, if a closet looks this big, I can probably put about twenty pieces in there, and it doesn't look like they would fit. <laughs> so, so I wanted to ask, um, you know, a lot of the work that we saw existed in your studio or in you know, various residency spaces, galleries, museums, but a lot of the work was also out in, uh, in the landscape, in architectural spaces. Um, can you talk a little bit about showing your work in spaces beyond museums and galleries and traditional spaces like that? Yes, um, it, I don't know if you remember the swing installation in the slideshow. That was in 2005, I made them at the Bina Center for Contemporary Arts and I was going to initially install those at the cherry orchards that is down the street from my house where I grew up. I always imagined them being there. And because I never went back to Omaha and because those pieces are placed already, um, I never got the chance to kind of fulfill that idea. And so I've been thinking about the orchards and the fields for a really long time. And uh, when I was in Davis, I only showed about two or three pieces that were at the grapevines and a few other places. But I took the, the rest of the pieces and I photographed them in my mother's backyard and, and then also in other places around the little town that I was born, that I was raised in. And, um, and so I, I really, uh, I'm trying to find, the, find a space for them that have a personal feel to them, but also a feel that other uh, migrant people can relate to as well. And I think the fields, uh, you know, working in uh, Willow Springs Elementary and working with the kids in that area, I really wanted to connect with them and have a conversation with them and somehow and, and also take art to them as well, you know. And so I thought that that um, would have been uh, a, a way for me to do it. But um, I also have some where I photograph them around New York. I just took my intern like I, I also do internships with um, the New York Arts Program. So every semester I have an intern that works with me. And in one particular semester, she just carried my pieces all over New York and uh, photographed them. And so, uh, and I did want to put them in downtown, but there's already a little girl there. <laughs> but, um, but I really did want to uh, see, put them in the context of this figure being in an empty space by themselves in a city and what, what that would feel like. 
you know. I'm not sure if it's a question or, or a comment, but I, I remember in the beginning of your presentation, you had mentioned um, the unicorn, and I think it's a kind of an interesting symbol. And I was wondering if you would be able to elaborate maybe a little bit more on, on the history of that and, and that in, incorporation. Yeah, um, I really took a big uh, different direction uh, during the um, lockdown. And um, I was really moved by what was happening with the Black Lives Matter marches outside and the idea that we were kind of trapped inside. And uh, my, uh, my partner is, uh, is also an artist and he, he'll make a huge stroke in like a second in a, in a huge canvas. And I, I really wanted to think about the concept of what it is to be locked in for a really long period of time. And so I took the finest brush that I could find like with two or, two or three hairlines and I researched uh, all these different bot botanicals from Africa, where they came from, what, what part of Africa they were. And I tried to uh, think of every, any, any color, any value. I try to change the value in the tint of each flower and, and have uh, you know five to six or seven different colors in one little stem and how I can do that. And I think part of it was echoing that idea of being in isolation and being trapped. And, and at the same time, uh, what was happening outside, you know, with, with, um, with the Black Lives Matter. And the idea that this unicorn, this white unicorn is considered to be magical and the, the meaning of that, the meaning of white and the meaning of black, you know. And then, um, and then I started thinking about what about, you know, the brown perspective as well. And so uh, some of the smaller unicorns I made were various tones of browns as well. Uh, but at the same time, I really wanted to talk about beauty, beauty and ideas of uh, Africa having rich resources in the same way that I was looking at the botanicals from Mexico and California of having a rich resource in history with botanicals as well, since I had been uh, looking at them for a long time and putting them in my watercolors. So I, I wanted to kind of bring those ideas together somehow. And also with the, uh, with the, the concept of an animal, um, I, I've been making animals for some time as well. Um, and some of them kind of look like me in some way. <laughs> At least that's what people tell me. They're like, oh, your portraits, your portraits, uh, people say that they're, they're a little bit about you or they look like you. But I think your dog, somebody told me, I think your dogs look more like you than, than, your, um, than your figures. And I thought that was a really interesting comment because they do, they, you can see the humanistic qualities, the humanistic emotion in the same way that you would see the, the figures. And so I think I tried to think about the unicorn uh, and the idea of making a portrait. How, how closely can I make it human and yet still be a horse or still be a unicorn? And, um, and I also uh, think about that with uh, when I'm actually making drawings and, and watercolors of dogs and cats and, uh, and birds and things like that is like I try to think about uh, changing the eyes to make them more look to look more human or creating some more reflection in the facial features to give it an attitude or to make it, you know, more, more human in some way. And so I think that uh, conceptually that idea kind of falls into questioning um, the humanity of animals. You know, the, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm hooked to animal videos on, <laughs> on the internet. And um, so the, the humanity of animals and in relationship to the humanity of human beings, you know, and the kindness and also the opposite of that, you know, the violence and the terror and all of these things. And when I think, um, I don't know if you remember the sculpture of titled um, Innocencia's Brutalidad, the, innocence brutality of the dog barking at the girl and the girl barking at the dog. Um, but that sculpture came about because um, when I was thinking about fear and violence, I was thinking that when a dog barks at you, um, he's usually afraid, you know, and I and I found that really interesting uh, to see that in humans as well. You know, a lot of the times when someone attacks you, um, I try to be, I try to think this person's hurting or this person has a different, you know, has their story. And so I'm not gonna attack back type of thing. And so, um, and I, so I think that's where that kind of came from is like the relationship between uh, anger, violence, attack and compassion and how can they intertwine in the same image in some way. 
you know, so that, so that I, I hope that the dog's eyes are fearful, but the teeth are growling, you know, at least that's kind of what I'm thinking about when I make them. Gabriella asks, oh, Gabriella. what aspect of Cuban sculpture are you drawn to and why? Um, I'm not familiar with Cuban sculpture. I mean, the only uh, Cuban artist that I'm really responded to is Ana Mandiatav. And I think part of it is because uh, she went to Mexico a few times and was really influenced by the culture there. And, and hence the, um, the Mother Earth performance and sculptures came about through her trips to Mexico. Um, and so uh, she's, a, she's one of, uh, she's a Cuban artist that I, um, I look at and really fond of and, and really interested in her theories and feminist theories and, and writings. Well, huge thanks to you, Claudia. We appreciate your generosity and time today. And thanks to all of you who attended and shared some of your afternoon with us. We appreciate you. Uh, reminder to visit our website to sign up for future episodes or to see archived episodes of Home Edition like this one, which will be there um, in a few weeks. Thanks again, Claudia. Um, thank you all and please take care and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.